Hello and welcome to this edition of Wineskins. I'm Father Jim Corda. Wineskins is a program that features reflections on the lives of the saints and the sacred scriptures, along with a variety of issues and topics, all from a Catholic perspective. Wineskins is brought to you through the annual Bishop's Appeal, the Catholic Communication Campaign, and St. Paul's Catholic Books and Gifts, a division of the Society of St. Paul. On our program today, I will interview Father Jim McCarns in part one from our series called Spotlight for the 75th anniversary of the Diocese of Youngstown. We will also hear more information on the Feast of the Chair of Peter. And today, as the Church celebrates the sixth Sunday in Ordinary Time, we will get a deeper insight into those particular Sunday readings. That and more on Wineskins. With me again is Steve Caratini, who is the Director of Social Concerns for the Diocese of Youngstown. Welcome back to Wineskins. Thank you so much. You know, the last time you were here, we spent some time talking about the Bishop's Appeal and some of the areas of social justice where folks can get involved. I think the area that I'd like us to focus on briefly is Hispanic ministry. We know it's certainly a growing ministry, not only here in the diocese, but in the church in general. What are some of the things that our diocese is doing in response to reaching out to Hispanics? That's one of the ministries that I was so pleased to be able to encounter when I came here to our diocese. To begin, the, one of the most important ways to minister to, to the Spanish-speaking population in our diocese is to be able to provide the sacraments, certainly the Mass. The offering of the Mass in Spanish is, is a wonderful blessing and, and opportunity, and I understand that CTNY is a big part of that, that outreach, and, and we're very, very grateful for that. We're also equally grateful for the six parishes, the six pastors that have a Spanish, a regular Spanish Mass on a weekly basis and are able to provide the gift of the Eucharist in our Spanish-speaking community. Father Ernesto Rodriguez heads up our Office of Hispanic Ministry, and uh, he's a very enthusiastic fellow and, and has a, a number of initiatives, creating a, a leadership institute at Walsh University for uh, young uh, adults who wish to become leaders in their parish communities, and continuing outreach through social media in Spanish, a number of other initiatives that link us with the national church in terms of being able to minister to the Hispanic community in a way that, that's sensitive to their culture and to their own needs. I know for us at CTNY, we're certainly very happy and very privileged to be part of that Hispanic ministry. And we would probably be remiss if we didn't say that part of that Hispanic outreach really has to do with immigration as well. Yes. In a nutshell, what do we need to be aware of as we move forward, especially in this light of immigration and those issues that surround the mm -hmm. whole thing? In a nutshell. <laughs> well, I think we have to always go back and remember that the history of our faith and the history of our country is one based on migration. And so migration is part of who we are. It's part of our DNA, and it's part of how this country was created, and it's part of how this valley came to life. And so uh, migration is going to be a fact of life, I think, moving forward, wherever we are in the world, but particularly here in our diocese. We're called by the church, we're called by God to welcome the stranger, to welcome the immigrant. As far as our department is concerned, and I, I try to, I understand that the debate on immigration can be very complex and very emotional. For us, it's about helping people. You know, we ask ourselves, what would Jesus do? The, the proverbial question. And as far as I can tell, when we look through the Gospels and look through the Scriptures, it's he would help people. He would help people who were not, who were the other, who were the outlier, who were the stranger, who were the, the outcast. So that example really is our bellwether. If someone comes to us, anyone who comes to us in need in our diocese, we will help. And I think also, in a nutshell, that is basic to who we are as Catholic Christians. You know, there are people who are always needing help, whether it's across the street or across the ocean. That's really kind of our call as Christians to respond to that. We don't have to do it always in heroic ways, right. but even in simple and kind ways. But I think also it's important for us to be informed. Yes. And why is it important for us to be informed? Well, you know, we're going to have a, a discussion about just immigration reform, 
and we're going to reform our immigration laws, which I think people on all sides of that argument agree needs to be done, then we need to have that as a fact-based. There needs to be uh, information that, that is presented. There are reasons why people have to flee their country. There are reasons why people are being asked to come to our country. And we have to be cognizant of what those are and cognizant of the realities of, of modern-day immigration law. It's nearly impossible for a peasant from or individual from Guatemala, for example, to get to the United States legally. And so how does one address the issue of injustice, of violence, of economic deprivation? Ideally, we, we want people to stay in their countries if that's what they choose to do and be able to thrive there. But if they can't, what do we do? So I, I think there's, there's a lot of information that the U.S. bishops, very glad to say, have been very been in the forefront of this effort since I've become involved in social services almost 20 years ago. So the information that they're providing, I think, is very important for all of us. And I'd just like to let the folks know that they can go to usccb.org for more information on this and many other issues. Unfortunately, our time is over. Steve Caratini, thank you so much for enlightening us, for being with us, and we look forward to your participation again. Thank you. For Wineskins, I'm Father Jim Corda. The Chair of Peter is celebrated on February 22nd. To tell us more is Rachel Herbelich. She is from St. Mary Joseph Church in Newton Falls. This feast is found in the oldest Roman calendar of 394, assigned to February 22nd, the day on which the Romans commemorated the deceased. At one time, there were two feasts of the Chair of St. Peter, one on January 18, celebrated in France in the 8th century, and one on February 22nd to commemorate the Chair of St. Peter at Antioch, for he had been there before going to Rome. The most ancient date for the celebration of this feast in St. Peter's Basilica in Rome is the middle of the 5th century, and it was preceded by a night vigil over which the Pope presided. Soon thereafter, the cult spread throughout Europe. Then, for some inexplicable reason, there was silence in the 7th and 8th centuries. Finally, it was again revived in the 11th and 12th centuries. The texts for the Mass and the Liturgy of the Hours serve as an excellent catechesis on the role of the Apostle Peter at a time when there are ecumenical discussions concerning the mission of Peter and his successors. The opening prayer portrays a central characteristic of St. Peter. You have built your church on the rock of St. Peter's confession of faith. Peter is thus the rock of the community of Christ, as is stated in the communion antiphon. You are Peter, the rock on which I will build my church. Because of Peter's confession, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. The jaws of death will not prevail against the church. It is by the power of God, and not by his personal strength, much less because he had experienced the weakness of a believer, that Peter is constituted the sure point of reference for our apostolic faith and serves as a motive for fidelity to the Word of God. In the numerous texts referring to St. Peter in the Liturgy of the Hours, we find references to Christ's promise that Peter would have primacy. Another theme for catechesis is found in the prayer over the gifts. With St. Peter as our shepherd, keep us true to the faith he taught and bring us to your eternal kingdom. The certitude of the apostolic faith is linked to his integrity and precisely because he is the shepherd of the people of God. In the prayer after communion, it is interesting to note the mention of the Eucharist, which is the sacrament of unity and peace. The liturgy thus links Peter, the visible sign of unity in the church, with the effects of the Eucharistic sacrifice. Ultimately, it is Christ, acting through this supreme sacrament, who guarantees the ministry of visible unity in the faith. But St. Leo the Great says in the Office of Readings, it is not without reason that the authority bestowed on all the apostles is entrusted to one. For Peter received it separately in trust because he is the prototype set before all rulers of the church. For Wineskins, I'm Rachel Herbelich. Hello and welcome to Spotlight. I'm Father Jim Corda. During this series, we're going to celebrate the 75th anniversary of the Diocese of Youngstown. And joining me in today's show is Father Jim McCarns, 
Welcome to Spotlight. Thank you. You know, you did some wonderful uh, work with us when we did our scripture series, and we thank you for that. And we thank you for coming back to share some of your experiences about anniversaries, about the Diocese of Youngstown. And I know you're from Selineville, Summitville mm -hmm. area. Before the taping, we were talking about why Father Fenwick would have found his way to Dungannon, the first uh -huh. really established parish in all Northeastern Ohio. And we kind of talked briefly about that. Why would he have come to this area? And what was going on at the time during Father Fenwick's visit? Mm -hmm. I don't know all the history, uh, but uh, I assume he was riding a horse. As I recall, Cincinnati was the diocese for Ohio, uh, like 1821 or so. So he was just probably going all over his diocese. <laughs> he had to go quite a mm -hmm. uh, ways north, probably stopped at Dungannon. And I think maybe because of the canal was going through, it was kind of a, sure. uh, seemed like it was a beginning to be a bustling town. Maybe that's why he stopped there. Yeah, okay. it's interesting. We are celebrating the 75 years of the Diocese of Youngstown. You obviously remember the 50th anniversary of the diocese, mm -hmm. and you've been ordained over 50 years, probably mm -hmm. 55, 55, 55 yeah. years. What do you remember about the 25th anniversary of the diocese. Anything that's significant that stands out in your mind? At the time, I, uh, somebody asked me that the other day, talking about the 50th, and I don't really recall too much about okay. the 50th. I came here for the, some of the lectures and some of the celebration, but I was happy to celebrate the 50th year, but it doesn't really register too much in my mind, uh, particular sure. events that were taking place at mm -hmm. that time. Let's talk about your young days as a young priest. You would have been ordained when Bishop Walsh right. was bishop. Uh -huh. Any recollections about him at all? Oh yes, I, I like Bishop Walsh. I went in to see him. I was. 17 years old. Well, I came from uh, Summitville in the country and I wasn't in Catholic school or anything, so I was a little nervous coming in to meet the bishop before the seminary. And I sat down. I remember he said to me, my, you're young. <laughs> and I reflected on that later. He was, I don't know how old he was, but he probably maybe was thinking back to his own life as a seminary and going into the seminary. He was a very friendly man, I thought. Mm -hmm. And he was in, uh, very encouraging. And I liked him. I never met a bishop before. Mm -hmm. So uh, I had good vibes of Bishop Walsh, yeah. Sure. And I should mention, uh, when he was sick, I stopped to visit him at St. Elizabeth's several times. And I sat down and, and, uh, at his bedside, and, and he kind of talked to me about his... I thought, uh, that's very nice. He just mm -hmm. said, well, maybe uh, I should have maybe the apostolic delegate maybe <laughs> should have come over. <laughs> but, but they sent me a letter, and he was a good person. Sure. I enjoyed him. Yeah. And obviously, Bishop Malone would have been, as many of us experience priesthood, mm -hmm. would have been the most significant presence as a bishop in our life. What is your recollections of Bishop Malone? Well, one thing I, I think, often think about Bishop Malone, he expressed himself so well. I kind of like to imitate the way he spoke. You know, we hear many talks and Bishop Malone, he wasn't just talking. Uh, talking for him was, was an art form. Mm -hmm. He would get up at a meeting and he would maybe say, I speak very briefly, unambiguously, and to the point. He had a command of language. And I did a um, sabbatical in Rome, and, and I was asked there by one of the priests, where are you from? I said, Youngstown. He said, oh, Malone, good man, good man. I was kind of always proud of M uh, Bishop Malone sure. and felt he was a capable person. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting because in our recollections, there are those priests or bishops that influenced us or mentored us in many and varied ways. Are there any priests in your young life that was an example to you that told you that this is something that I think I'd like to do? 
My first pastor uh, that I was served for was Monsignor Barden in St. Charles, mm -hmm. and he had all kinds of stories to yeah. tell. So he influenced me, and he was also my pastor at Summitville, uh, where I made my first mm -hmm. communion. I always liked the way he talked. Uh, he didn't use a microphone in the church where I was a child growing up, and he, he would talk very loud, and then his voice would dropped down so low, and we'd, we'd listen again. He just kept us all alert. I mean, we'd say, well, if he didn't uh, light your fire, your wood was wet, you know? <laughs> he just, he, he, he was up and down, we'd listen to him, and his talking there would always kind of intrigue me. One priest that Bree Malone was kind sure. of an example, and mm -hmm. he, was, he was my pastor of Somerville for okay. about six months, I think it was. Okay. I always kind of looked up to him, and uh, a lot of the uh, Blaine Pierce mm -hmm. was, uh, I thought, a classic person, too. So those are kind of people that I imitated, I, I liked, and mm -hmm. I said, well, I'd like to do things like they do. For more pertinent information and to listen to Wineskins, visit www.doy.org, the website of the Catholic Diocese of Youngstown. Stay with us. We'll be back in a moment. January is Poverty Awareness Month. What does it mean to live in poverty? It means swallowing your pride when asked why you just don't move to a better apartment or get your kids' teeth fixed or a hundred other things that cost money you just don't have. It's feeling hopeless because people who have better lives are convinced you did something to deserve your poverty. It also means getting assistance with clothing, food, shelter, and other basic needs. Heat during the winter season is one of those needs. Last year, Catholic Charities impacted 5,733 people through its utility assistance efforts. This urgent need for heat and utility assistance continues to rise. Keep the Kids Warm helps Catholic Charities provide direct utility assistance to families with children. Please support your parish collection for Keep the Kids Warm this year. For more information, visit www.ccdoy.org or call Catholic Charities at 330-744-8451. The first Sisters of the Humility of Mary came together in France in 1854. In their rule, approved by the Bishop of Nancy in 1858, the founding sisters gave expression to their faith and their lived experience. The entire community came to the United States of America in 1864, including nine professed sisters, two novices, three orphan girls, and Father John Joseph Begel, the spiritual director for the little community, and their ecclesial liaison. In regard to the Eucharist, their rule translated into English in 1877 clearly stated that they will love and serve Jesus Christ in his real and natural body, that is to say the Holy Eucharist, in his temples. And they will serve him in his mystic body, their neighbors, who are his members. The personal experiences of the First Sisters of the Humility of Mary was one of wonder and reception of God's gratuitous gift of love in the person of Jesus Christ. This lived experience was also one of meeting Jesus in the sacrament of the Eucharist and of meeting and serving Him in the sacrament of their neighbor. It was in Dungannon, Ohio, in Columbiana County, that one of the first group of Catholics settled. St. Philip Neri, the first parish in all northern Ohio, was founded in 1817 under the title of St. Paul's Settlement. It was to visit this settlement that Father Edward Fenwick, the Apostle of Ohio, made his first trip to Northern Ohio. Four years later, Cincinnati was chosen as a sea city in the state of Ohio, and Fenwick was selected as the first bishop. Today, St. Philip Neri remains the oldest parish in the Diocese of Youngstown, but it is also one of the smallest. Congratulations, Catholic Diocese, for celebrating 75 years with pride in the past and faith in the future. Church World Service believes that being self-reliant is a joy everyone should share. 
So around the block or around the world, share the joy. Our song today is from the CD called Endless Mercy. It is by Vinnie Flynn and Still Waters. As we celebrate this sixth Sunday in Ordinary Time, we will hear more about the Sacred Scriptures by Monsignor John Zura. He is pastor of St. Rose Church in Girard. As we celebrate the sixth Sunday of Ordinary Time, we begin with a simple question. If you're experiencing difficulties, how does the Sacred Scripture readings of today comfort you? We're reminded that trust is not always easy to define in the abstract, but we know it when we see it. 
We know that we must trust to take the leap before something can be experienced. Today's readings invite each and every one of us to take the leap of faith, to trust in the Lord who gives us life. In our first reading from Jeremiah, it's consisted of a collection of wisdom sayings centered on the importance of trusting in God and the foolishness of turning away and trusting in human values. St. Luke reminds us in today's Gospel reading that we encounter Jesus as the large crowd of Jews and non-Jews who were gathered on the plain in Galilee to hear Jesus speak. He goes on to deliver the most familiar Beatitudes, which are in fact about trusting in God, who cares for those who suffer. Jesus also includes a matching series of woes that focus on those who have turned away from God by refusing to do their own part and alleviating the sufferings of the world. Where do we stand when it comes to helping our brothers and sisters in need who are suffering? And in our second reading, 2 Corinthians reminds us in a small part of a longer teaching on the doctrine of the bodily resurrection. In this section, St. Paul explains the consequences of not accepting this teaching. In effect, he says, we would have to declare that Christ was not raised and that our faith is in vain. We know Christ was raised. And St. Paul reminds us that all who trust in his name will be raised to the newness of life. For Wineskins, I am Monsignor John Zura. Let us put our trust in God and become like the tree planted beside the waters that stretches out its roots to the streams. That kind of faith can stand the test of time. Wineskins is a production of CTNY, the Catholic Telecommunications Network of Youngstown. It is brought to you by the Annual Bishop's Appeal, the Catholic Communication Campaign, and St. Paul's Catholic Books and Gifts. I'm your host, Father Jim Corda, wishing you a beautiful week. What have you done for your marriage today? I gave my wife a hug this morning. I thought uh, I love her. I uh, did her hair this morning. I think it looks pretty good. <laughs> I cooked my husband's uh, favorite breakfast. I bought her an orchid. What have I done for my marriage today? I sent my husband a love email. I read the newspaper to my wife and it cracked her up. She's, but she's still laughing. <laughs> what have you done for your marriage today? Make a change for the better. Need help? Go to foryourmarriage.org. A message from the Catholic Church. They say America is the land of opportunity, but for some, life isn't so easy. Right now in America, one in six children lives below the poverty line. That's nearly 13 million children of all races all across our country. Where do you draw the line and get involved? You can make a difference in more ways than you think. Go to povertyusa.org today, because one in six children in poverty is one too many. A message from the Catholic Campaign for Human Development.